Hello, this is Lena Saleh. And I'm Dima Khouri. We're from Samsar Design Studio. We have another two partners, Rami Kasberi and Dana Masad. Samsard is a collective of architects that are like-minded and have the same reactions on the political, socio-economical, and environmental challenges. We are the generation of post-Oslo Accord Peace Agreement in the early 90s. We have witnessed the construction boom and the urban transformation in our towns. This is a typical scenery of what a Palestinian city looks like. Our conventional building materials are massive. They are built of concrete and cladded with stone veneer. Stone is mined from our valleys to fulfill the building regulations of stone cladding, rather than any other structural reasons. We use cement that we do not produce, and steel that we do not produce as well in our buildings. We deplete our natural resources that are already restricted and unaccessible by the occupation. We change the ground cover and, uh, and in order to beauti beautify our buildings. So besides the immediate context that we have around us, we also became aware of how the Israeli occupation has affected the building industry by the control and exploitation of our natural resources. This is the West Bank, uh, occupied by Israel in 1967, and still occupied, although it was supposed to be handed to the Palestinians. Although Israel has a number of queries in its 1948 territories, uh, it prefers depleting resources in the territories it has occupied. According to the Geneva Accords, and conventions, it's illegal for occupying powers to exploit natural resources in occupied land. So this is a map showing 11 illegal quarries. Um, what happens is that Israel mines uh, the resources uh, in the territories and sells it back to us. So this high amount of mining activities uh, not only causes important waste and pollution, but has a huge repercussion on the ecology and health of beings and people in the area. So also one of the unfortunate results of the Oslo Accords um, is that the Palestinians are not allowed to establish any recycling facility. So waste ends up in our filling, oh, waste ends up filling our uh, landscapes and wadis. For thousands of years, our ancestors have left these landscapes in the back for us. And in return, this is what we're leaving to our children. The building industry being responsible of a huge portion of the pollution and landfill waste. When I say building industry, I mean the whole cycle of the building industry, from resource mining to processing, uh, to the transportation of the materials to the site, uh, and to the pollution coming out directly from the construction itself. So we as builders have a responsibility to see where the material comes from and where it ends up, like instead of just handing a key to the client and leaving. So how do we tackle all these problems? Uh, we started in a very small scale. So we started with waste, uh, and especially construction waste. We felt our responsibility as architects and engineers of all the weights we generate in our buildings. So we literally started collecting the trash from the streets and from the construction sites. Here we can see PVC pipes and the plastic wraps that are used in the packaging of tiles and stones. Uh, the steel rebars that we collected from the construction sites in order to build some furniture pieces. Uh, what was more important than the design itself or the furniture object was the conversation that we started with people when we started to install our um, design objects in the streets and in their houses. Uh, people became more aware or started to ask, why are you doing this and why do you think it's important? So we, we put some um, furniture in public libraries, and in the streets, as I said. 
in our office. And in the streets, um, we were passing by the streets where we installed an old uh, barrel. And there was this old woman sitting and cheering with her family. So we asked her, do you like this chair? And she was like, it's really awesome because I always used to walk up the street and there was nothing I can rest on. Uh, so we told her that that was from an old material and it seems that they were okay with this. So we launched with an exhibition, we called it experiment number one, where we showcased 42 furniture pieces, all from trash. And what was surprisingly for us, that people really liked it and started to buy them for their houses. So after that point, we were searching for an alternative building material that is approachable, local, low cost, and has a low environmental impact. We started with what was beneath our feet, the earth. In fact, our studio's name, Shams Ard, means sun and earth. We started testing with the earth and mixing different recipes. Uh, we also made all the blocks on site so we could reduce all the, all the transportation costs. This guy over there, his name is Abu Sagar. He's from Gaza, and he came to Ramallah to help us with, uh, with uh, training the workers. He was a master, or as we call him in Arabic, the Ma'allam, and he built some buildings in Gaza earlier from Earth. He couldn't get his permit renewed by the Israelis, so he couldn't continue with us. But fortunately, he passed on his skills and trained other workers. We have used stabilized compressed earth blocks to build this Nubian vault in an eco room. And we also plastered the building with earth. We pushed the boundaries and got ourselves out of our comfort zone by building with different domes, vaults, the crossed vaults, and the barrel vaults. And we tried with different arches. The material of Earth is really forgiving, and it allowed us for all of this experimentation. There is a great body of knowledge that we have inherited, but it's either dying or inaccessible and unavailable in books. So we had to meet with local communities and to look more deeply in our cities. And when I say our cities, I mean all the Palestinian cities in the historical Palestine. This city, for example, Zdud, it's where my grandparents are from. It's on the Mediterranean seashore. They were forced to flee in 1948. It was interesting for me to see the articulations, the colorings, and the adaptations that people had made in their dwellings in that area. In Syria, for instance, cob houses, dome-shaped rooms, uh, houses were familiar. So the climatic responsive architecture in the Levant area is very similar. But as a result of all the colonial geopolitical fragmentation of the area, we have lost the flow of and the continuity of the collective knowledge and techniques. The vernacular architecture, for example, in Jericho City, in the West Bank of Palestine, is almost lost. This is how Jericho City looks like nowadays. Despite that the earth is an abundant material in Jericho, and despite that it's the oldest continuously inhabited human settlement in the world, with an evidence of adobe, of adobe bricks, or as we call it in Arabic, a tub, people have shifted away from earth to, to build with cement-based materials. They even have a bad image on, on the earth. This image issue is actually really hard to deal with, and it was for us a more complex story than solving the techniques of Earth. This is Ahmed Daoud's house, built in Jericho. Uh, Ahmed has lived in Yarmouk refugee camp in Syria all his life. Uh, although he has grown up in the refugee camp, he has often heard about his grandfather's mud house, and it was always his dream to have his own mud house. So this house is a private house. Uh, the technique that was used uh, was the technique of earth bags. Uh, we used this technique to compare costs with the compressed earth blocks that we have used uh, previously and to try to reduce the costs. Uh, so first we laid the stem wall 
uh, over the foundations. Um, this also protects the, the building from humidity. The circular shape as well that was used uh, in the building helps the building in being more resilient um, to any seismic uh, activity. So earth bags are filled uh, with, so earth bags are filled and laid over each other. Um, workers for this project were also trained on site. At first, uh, they were reluctant and skeptical, um, especially that we were women architects, most of us, and uh, young architects. So even the neighbor of Ahmed uh, was trying to convince him to build in concrete, telling him it was faster and, uh, and, the one, and he, was, he didn't understand what he was doing, basically. And the, the roof is going to fall on his head. And uh, so, um, so the building was building at the same time in a conventional way next to him. Uh, what happened at this time is that cement was forbidden to enter Jericho, and that's year 2012. Um, so basically, uh, the neighbor was a bit more convinced <laughs> at a later stage. Um, indeed, Ahmed's house was built in a time of three months only. So no formwork was used for this building, except for the openings, uh, which also reduced the cost of the building. Uh, basic and simple tools were used to help build the shape of the dome. Uh, the compass was used to keep the bags uh, at the same level, and a chain was used to draw the shape of the dome from inside. Um, openings at the top of the building were kept open for natural ventilation and lighting. So as we can see here, the windows and doors were treated the same as the stone arches. So there's the keystone, which holds the arch, and we like to call it the key bag here. Um, the finishing stage after the completion of the construction was similar in the sense that we used the same materials that we used in the construction process with different mixes of lime plaster. We filled the gaps with mortar to start the plaster layer. The workers here became more engaged with the building itself. So we, we can see here, in the next one, yeah, we can see that this worker is taking care of the finishing and smoothing the surface. They started to believe in what they were building. The high thermal mass of the earth helps in storing the heat during the day and reflecting it at night, which is convenient in a hot, arid climate like some cities in Palestine. Natural lighting was also taken care of so the light will sneak inside the masses of the domes. The intersection of the domes also created unusual interior spaces. We also used traditional tiles. There are only two factories left in the West Banks for the traditional tiles. And actually, no one goes there except for some institutions. The house itself became a hand-sculpted building. We used also the Malkov, which is also known as the wind catcher, to cool down the air and helps in the air circulation instead of using mechanical systems. This is Rami, our colleague. <laughs> uh, so finally, in our buildings, more than 70% of the money goes to the local communities instead of going to the cement factories outside of Palestine or from Israel. We have, we believe, as architects, a responsibility to act, a responsibility to act in a way to, fo to face all the challenges and to help our communities in become more resilient and independent. Thank you.